Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. This is uh, a session on crowdfunding. I see we have a crowd. Um, if you want to stand at the back, fine. I don't know if they can find any more chairs, but we're delighted to have such a good group. We've been doing a series of projects on a series of sessions on money matters, and I've been asked to do the sessions on alternative forms of funding. So yesterday we were looking at uh, branded entertainment and sponsorship. We were talking with bankers and venture capitalists. But here we are in back to the roots democracy. We are get funding from the crowd. My name is Pat Ferns. I'm an independent producer from Canada. I'm delighted to have with me Slava Rubin, who is uh, flown over from New York. He's the CEO of Indiegogo. Next to him is Barbara Tonelli, Director of Acquisitions for Tuscopod from France. And uh, next to me will be Peter Wintonic um, from iSteel Films in Canada. His own company is Necessary Illusions. Um, the fact that I'm going to be set on a question and he isn't isn't a result of my insecurities. It's just that I've had a hip replacement, so I have to keep my hip higher than my knee. Anyway, I thought I knew absolutely nothing about crowdfunding, um, and so I was really looking forward to this session so I could learn about it. And then I realized inadvertently I'd been doing some crowdfunding. I had a producer who lived across the road who said she could get a grant for $25,000, and would I produce this little short drama for her? for, for $25,000, and I said yes. And then I started looking at the pa pieces of paper, and it was from a, uh, something in Canada called Bravo Fact, and it said they'll give you up to $25,000 matching for every cent you raised. So I summoned this lady across the road and said, um, you've actually got no money to make this film, so if we're gonna do it, you've gotta go off and find it. She said, how can I do that? And I said, well, you just gotta start writing to your friends and we drafted letters and whatever. And um, as of last week, she had raised $20,000, so she can match it, $40,000, and we're confident we're gonna get the full 50. So I guess I was crowdfunding. So um, uh, we'll uh, find out a hell of a lot more, because these are people who are really expert in um, uh, the, the business, the techniques, how it works. And um, I'm really excited to learn along with you. And I think I'm going to ask Peter Wintonic to lead us off and give us a kind of overview of what's been going on in the field and uh, look at some of, some of the best practices. So, Peter. OK. Uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, you can hear me? I would just yell. Um, well, you've had a hip replacement. You're pretty hip, then, if you're into crowdfunding already. That's right. You were a very illustrious producer, but that's when, when you first invited me uh, here, uh, I, I really said, well, really, why does MIPCOM need to talk about crowdfunding with all the money that seems to be floating in those lower levels of this, this building, but maybe it's an illusion, and maybe it's really about the kind of crisis we have. I, I'm a documentary, feature-length documentary producer generally, so we, we, we know there's a kind of crisis in public service television, support for documentaries, and, and kind of g general, I've heard there's an economic crisis somewhere in different parts of the world. Uh, so, so I guess it does necessitate the, the need for a kind of crowdfunding. I wanted to just get into a kind of a contextual background, a bit of a history of crowdfunding before the real experts with the, the, uh, the aggregators, I call them, uh, who provide really great service. Uh, take over with some case study. So uh, we'll try this uh, PowerPoint, which I'm calling the, the wisdom of crowds. And I'll have to be pointing this at some of you, but don't be offended, because I'm really pointing at the back of the room, I think, at a computer. Uh, so I was th really thinking, I've heard this w word monetized in about seven elevators yesterday, as people come in from or out of meetings saying, oh, we, we've got to monetize this and monetize that. I didn't know it was a verb, really, but um, it's uh, monetize me is really a short form, I think, for what crowdfunding is all about. It's about the, well, in, in a more serious note, the kind of the, uh, I call a matrix of crowdfunding, this little talk anyway, or really 
what I think we're living in this kind of what I call the eight continent world, which there are seven physical continents, but the new continent really is the the web, the net web, and it's we're living in this international world. So and, and I think post capitalist. I hope. Um, so within that kind of context, uh, how do we include uh, the idea of the public in uh, in our financing plans? I think we have to be precise. This was billed as crowdsourcing. Uh, but I like to differentiate and sp be specific about it and call it crowdfunding. Slava has a little take on that idea as well. Crowdsourcing, I, fig I find more and more what we're talking about when we're uh, getting user-generated content into our productions. There are a lot of good examples, A Day in the Life, the most recent one on a feature-length uh, version. So we're t talking about crowdfunding here. here. This is the first evidence I've found of the use of the word. But, uh, Michael Sullivan, who was a, a video blogger, a V blogger, uh, writing about this. So this is ancient history now, five years ago, in, 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 a, in a world where a generation is six months. Uh, uh, the, the latest thing is crowdfunding. Uh, whether it's smoke and mirrors or really uh, going to have a serious life in our uh, financial planning is uh, to be uh, determined. But let's assume that the old political economy, we call it, the old way of funding films and, uh, and media, television shows, in fact, uh, isn't working so well. Uh, partly, there's, we're in this ethos where everyone's a content creator. Everybody with an iPhone really is a producer, what I, or what I call a producer. We're both consuming and using, but we're also contributing, whether that's in a kind of uh, amateurish way or a professional way. Um, almost every uh, citizen on earth now is a producer. So we have this, inf this problem with the, this infinite number of productions competing for a finite number of euros or whatever currency you live in. Uh, and, and this other problems that uh, I think, at least for documentary content creators, uh, we've grown dependent on the largesse of public uh, systems of financing. I know in Canada, we've had Telefilm Canada and the media funds and in Europe with media and all of the different uh, iterations of that. And the national funds have been uh, publicly uh, supported funds. But uh, this is all a bit in crisis. So let's just assume in the Michael Moore uh, system of the world that the old order isn't working. So this is, I find myself doing more and more Praying, praying for Canadian dollars, which are, are on par, I think, with U.S. dollars. So, it, it, oh, so we don't have to pray so hard these days. But I think producers, whether you're doing television or factual or documentary or any kind, of, we find ourselves martyred uh, somehow trying to do good work and taking what I call uh, the, well, the producer's vow of poverty. Um, so, to dim diminish and dismiss all of that, we should, uh, and put our faith in what I call the wisdom of crowds. Here we have a big crowd in London protesting against the uh, Bush invasion of some country or another once upon a time. Um, uh, because I think we're in a world now that really is what I call green roots or grassroots world, we're bottom up, as you mentioned, I think uh, the democratic notions of Everything in life is changing. It's maybe not so evident yet at MIPCOM, but that's why we're here. Um, <laughs> I call it fair trade media. And it's an impulse we find uh, streaking across the world, and we better get a hold of it quickly as producers and, and as citizens of the world as well. But the, I think the original crowdfunding really came <laughs> with Christianity. <laughs> and we have St. Peter, of course. Um, and the and the, I don't know why they were using American dollars in in, in Bethlehem or wherever that was, but anyway, that's for me. That's crowdfunding. So there are a lot of antecedents to crowdfunding. It's not just with the electronic age that we have crowdfunding. In fact, I was raising money from the public in the 80s, pre-internet. Wow, um, you know, from public subscription organizing, and we raised a million dollars for a film that I produced with Peter Watkins. Uh, from the public uh, without the internet. Of course, the, we're already 
like Pat was saying with his little project, but also I think Hollywood is already crowdfunding, but it's called banks. And what is a bank other than, well, your bankers yesterday were telling you, but it's public money generally. Our money in banks is financing Hollywood. Um, but there are, in, in more serious terms, a lot of precedents for the kinds of uh, thinking that come around crowdfunding. It's, we've been, you know, given money to the Red Cross and disasters in Haiti and whatever the earthquakes are happening this week. And, um, and uh, investigative journalism was getting funded by the public, uh, uh, video blogs. Uh, these are kind of antecedents. For software development for the last 20 years, we've had shareware and freeware and these other things where we're expected to make a contribution if we download. Uh, if we're ethical downloaders. So this is all antecedents, really. Um, the music industry is always seven years ahead of whatever we do in the visual media, I think. And they've been crowdfunding independent music, which is why after the peer-to-peer -peer systems got invented with Napster and others uh, and destroyed the corporate music industry uh, or made it alter itself, uh, fan-based uh, crowdfunding for music has been around for a, for a decade. So these are kinds of, uh, I'll just take one of them. I mean, the BBC licenses are really, that's, uh, if you watch public television in America, every uh, three weeks they're interrupting the flow of programs so they could put on a three hour kind of telethon asking you, the public, uh, to invest. So these things have been happening quite a bit, I think over the last few decades. Um, public money through fiscal sponsors and we're, what I call or we call uh, film anthropy um, it's really um, tax flow tax credits all these kinds of things that really are kind of public uh, investment in in the work that we do w within the kind of society as well there are kind of the social movements and social networks which are now um, codependent on uh, the electronic uh, media are, are, have been around, um, and the theories of crow on crowds, about crowds, are starting to develop. So uh, Slava's organization really understands a lot of the algorithms of, of what the public wants and how to do these things. Um, generally, the different, there are lots of different kinds of crowdfunding. I'll break them down in a second to uh, two systems, but generally they're characterized, as um, far as I can uh, analyze in my little matrix here. They're worldwide. They're taking advantage of the fact that uh, internet can be one to one or many to many or many to one or one to uh, all the different variations of this. They're uh, really depending on niche uh, contact, contact with the niche, but also when you aggregate all the niches, you get this idea of mega niche, which can, you know, a, a, an idea you're trying to fund for even a local production. As I think Tusco Pro uh, 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 will point out, for regional productions can be financed by people halfway across the globe. So these are kind of interesting uh, characteristics, we'll say. Uh, and generally, they are uh, more democratic than the normal systems. Um, so these are just kind of types of systems. Um, we're really trying to target. Uh, how one targets and uh, what I call communities of concern, people with kind of vested interest in your projects. Uh, uh, this is the, really the uh, the golden ring, I think, to to be uh, obtained and figure out how one reaches those kind of uh, communities in different parts of the globe. And some of the um, sort of theories behind these crowdfunding systems, really, you're you're really working on a kind of direct one-to-one, -one, even though it's through a computer uh, solicitation. And the most important thing, I think, is this idea of crowd theory anyway about reciprocity. Nobody wants, you, you have to get something. If you, want, if you give something, you want something. It's kind of maybe human nature, but uh, so a lot of these crowdfunding systems are um, sort of based on premiums if you invest a certain level of money in a project or donate certain level of money, you're going to get back a kind of uh, a premium or bonus. A lot of it, uh, it only comes into f the fore in the last few years because of these kinds of technical things like um, 
um, micropayments, which are allowable and permissible now almost all over the world, where uh, you can exchange in, um, through your credit cards or Amazon dollars or, or uh, PayPal uh, money for, uh, in, not as investment so much in projects, but as these kinds of uh, donations. So uh, some of the systems are uh, based on an open kind of timeline. You put up a project and you have as much time as you want for people to invest. Other ones are uh, delineated by a kind of very finite, you have 40 days. Is this in the case of your project perhaps? You have so many days to raise that $25,000. Um, many of the, f um, the systems are around finite time frames. Um, these are just some of what I call host aggregators. They're not just uh, involved with your specific project. Some of them are um, based uh, only uh, within the film and media community. Some of them are uh, putting up all sorts of projects, charitable projects with strange uh, in, um, investments into anything, really, trying to raise money for anything, not just film. So sometimes you're, some of these aggregator sites are, have a wide variety of different projects and not all of them are films. Um, so you have to really do some uh, investigation into that. And then I differentiate those aggregators from individual filmmakers who are, create their own kind of uh, uh, crowdfunding. Uh, some of these are great examples. Franny Armstrong uh, raised 1.5 million um, pounds. Uh, half of that for the project itself and half of it to finance the outreach, which that film reached into 300 cities and, and did wide distribution. It's an ecological documentary. Um, Robert Greenwald has been doing crowdfunding for uh, about five or six years. He depends on a kind of fan base of, and a big database that he's accumulated of people who have supported his, uh, his work over the years. So he needed uh, very quickly uh, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars within two weeks to make a film about the Iraq war he was doing and he, w he went directly solicitation to his uh, database and found that money very quickly that kind of thing happens with Michael Moore he's got a database of five million people on his uh, michaelmoore.com uh, so he could go to the public in very easily like that instead of going to the uh, Miramax and, and, the, and the brothers Miramax to, uh, to do that. Um, there are uh, these other, there's a feature film that's getting funded by crowdfunding. There's quite a few different things. I, I, I won't um, get into any details with that, but you could just uh, investigate something like The Age of Stupid. A lot of the learning about how to do crowdfunding, some of these sites uh, in, incorporate. So they, there are good case studies about uh, uh, taking you through the detail. And uh, this is uh, Ann, uh, Franny's kind of premium chart, you know, for so much of investment of 20 pounds, you get so much back, you get a t-shirt or whatever, it would be up to, uh, there were some investments that were up to 30,000 pounds, I think, in that. Uh, this is one system we won't talk about too much today, but it's uh, generally uh, one of the uh, emerging players for filmmakers. Uh, our friend uh, Jennifer Fox recently ro raised a, $140,000 for her film about her own guru. Um, but the average uh, for the, of these kinds of figures are, are, I think, above the average. I think between twenty dollars and $40,000 generally are getting raised through kind of uh, these crowdfunding systems. Voto is a kind of crowdfunding, but on the reverse end. It's after projects have been done uh, through a kind of bit torrent, uh, Pirate Bay kind of system. Projects are put up, and then the public is asked to to do a donation if they want to see the next work from from the filmmaker. So it creates a kind of uh, ongoing relationship that the public has with filmmakers. Uh, this is the great Indiegogo that Slava will really talk about in in specifics. There are lots of uh, I would say services. I mean, it's great that everybody's here in the room and wanting to learn, and I, I'm learning. Uh, about it as, as we go as well. We're, I'm more interested in the kind of uh, the, the movement of the crowdfunding rather than having to rely on it uh, too much to complete some of the bigger budget films I have. But you could start with Wikipedia or um, uh, Lance Wheeler. These are kind of tools where you can 
Peter Broderick. You can Google some of these people. Uh, and uh, w w with a kind of knowledge base of how you can really s do a kind of slow entry into crowdfunding your next uh, projects. Uh, so maybe you two will get into more, uh, more of these details, but there's sort of key elements, I think, in, a, in, <coughs> in designing a good cr crowdfunding campaign. I'll just speak to the first one, really. You have to really just, as much as it seems like manna from heaven or euros from heaven, you really have to do, as a producer, uh, a lot of work. I was just at a crowdfunding panel in South Africa last week and with three case studies, and each one of these senior producers was really uh, decrying the fact that they didn't know how much work it was before they really got into it. It seems simple. There's a lot of hype and mirrors about it, but there's uh, a lot of work, and, and many production companies now are hiring what are called kind of outreach directors as a, an, another kind of a job to fill. There are problems uh, with, maybe we'll get into Q and A's about these things, but uh, there's some questions of legalities, whether or not these things are investments or donations, and each country sometimes has different kind of securities laws, so uh, these are kind of tricky uh, questions. Uh, th most of them are getting worked out now with the more than 200 crowdfunding uh, aggregators that are out there. Um, but it, a lot of it uh, really depends on the work of the producer. Um, anyway, the, uh, to sum up, really, here is the, uh, the benefits. We can make a living uh, through crowdfunding. They're more democratic. These are all fake graphs, but it'll, it'll give you an idea. You know, we used to only get a very small percentage of returns. In the, uh, now we can, of course, increase our returns sevenfold. Uh, we have to storm the old order of funding uh, towers uh, and build, uh, crowdfund uh, the future, I think. The old order is that little part of that graph and the bright new future for all of us as we uh, crowdfund uh, uh, what I call a global local world. It, it's getting really easier now to raise money everywhere in the world through these systems. The biggest problem I find will have how to convince other uh, partners in the kind of production financing scheme, w whether those agencies or broadcasters or private investors, how they can accept the fact that parts of your film will be funded by the uh, public. But this will be your reward, a crowd flood of money um, and wave upon wave of happiness. <laughs> Crowdfunded happiness is guaranteed so we can all survive as producers and make what I call fair trade media. Because, as we see in the streets this year, all over the world, the crowd really is the thing. So thanks. Terrific. Thank you very much, Peter. That's an extremely helpful way in. And of course, we've got two of the major uh, content aggregators and crowdfund players with us. And so first of those is going to be um, Slava Rubin from Indiegogo, who's going to really take us through in detail how you go about crowdfunding your film. And is the magic of your computer working? Yeah, we're good. All right. All right. Let's check my clock over there. All right, well, Peter has tons of experience and lots of theory to discuss. Obviously, he's done crowdfunding before the internet, which just shows that it's nothing new. I'm going to talk with a lot of, should we say, crowdfunding platform experience. I'm going to talk really fast. I'm sorry. Sometimes I talk about this stuff for three hours, and people still want to keep asking me questions. So I'm going to give you a fire hose of information that you're going to want to write down really, really fast, I promise. But this will go up on our blog in a few weeks, and you can go check it out. And uh, so we're just going to start from there. I promise you'll be interested. So uh, let's just back up a hair. I can't go back all the way to the church, which is actually a wonderful example. But I'll go back to the late 1800s, and I'll connect it to France. So the French gave the Statue of Liberty to America. But they weren't nice enough to actually give the base, you know, the actual thing that the statue has to go on. So they made the Americans fund that by themselves. So the Americans needed to raise nearly $300,000 to actually have the base to be able to put the Statue of Liberty on. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to take the Statue of Liberty. So they were able to raise about $150,000 through the governments and through investors. And then they had over a $100,000 gap 
This is the late 1800s, that's a lot of money. And they weren't gonna be able to get the Statue of Liberty. But Joseph Pulitzer, who's obviously an important American writer, journalist, et cetera, who was connected to that time, the New York Times, before it was called the New York Times, reached out through the New York Times, a physical written request, saying if we don't raise about $120,000, $130,000, we're not gonna have the Statue of Liberty. He offered nothing in return. He offered nothing in return, not even a premium. The amazing thing is not that he got funded, because for those of you who have been to America or seen the movies, the Statue of Liberty is next to New York City. It's not the fact that it's there. It's the fact that the average contribution was 83 cents. So they raised $130,000, yay, but it was 83 cents, which means that almost 150,000 people gave the money, and they didn't give it for anything in return. The distance of what that paper, The New World, was able to reach was what, 10 kilometers, 100 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers, whatever kilometers you want. But it was very small. So fast forward today, you now have the internet. Instead of a newspaper, you have the world. I mean, instead of New York, you have the world. Instead of a newspaper, you have the internet. Things move very fast. And if people in the late 1800s can fund $130,000 for nothing, what can you do today if you actually gave them something? That could be pretty good. So let's just step back just say, I promise you, I would talk really fast. It's just going to stay interesting. I'm going to keep looking over here. Over here. Um, so when I was uh, 15, my dad died of cancer. And then 10 years later, I started a charity because I finally wanted to deal with it. Because for 10 years, I couldn't deal with it. And then I started my own charity to raise money for cancer research. This was 2005, 2006, so you can figure out my age, whatever. And uh, it was actually really annoying. For those of you who can actually remember a generation back, you know, a decade back, a, a whole millennium back, 2005, 2006. Remember that MySpace is significantly bigger than Facebook. None of you practically are on Facebook yet, right? YouTube has just started. Twitter is practically non-existent. Obama is not a word yet. And it definitely wasn't crowdfunded in America, OK? But there was definitely inklings of social media and the ability to use the internet to get the masses to do something was happening. So at that time, I got really frustrated with using MySpace. I talked to my co-founders, my two friends, who had been on the board of a theater company, who had been working with filmmakers to raise money. And we all said, wow, isn't this crazy? This internet thing, which is supposed to be the ultimate de democratization tool, is we don't think being used correctly. It's just taking manual processes, which are manual donations, and moving them onto the internet so they're automated, which is like garbage, because that's not really taking advantage of the internet. And they said, oh, there's got to be a platform which just lets you to crowdfund whatever idea you want. Because at the end of the day, if the market wants it to happen, they'll fund it. Well, the funny thing is that really didn't exist. And that could be argued. But it didn't really exist. So we launched it in January 2008, um, being one of the leading, should we say, early crowdfunding platforms. Again, all of this can be argued. But uh, that's less important for this discussion. The key here is now we're three and a half years later, and the reason you'll want to hear me talk is because I'll give you all this information, because we now have the leading platform in the world where literally every single country has funded using our site. We distribute millions of dollars in every country every month. So this isn't theory. There are no fake charts. We're going to talk about all reality. I'm going to talk about 40,000 points of data which have been analyzed, and I'm going to tell you how to have a better crowdfunding campaign. And now you're saying, what is this all about? I'll just show you an example. Which this is purposely not a movie example, because I wanted to take you out of the mind that this is about movies. This is about anything in life. Hi, I'm Brian. And I'm Vlad. And together we call ourselves Satari. We both love taking video, but hate being stuck in front of the webcam or having friends do it for you. And since video is getting so good on our phones, we came up with a cool new mobile video accessory that we'd like to share with you.
There's a little bit more. Hope you enjoyed the vision. We're two product designers that have been working for the last year out of this garage office to bring this idea to you. The idea is relatively simple. Slip your video he's, phone he's into the base. Focus on Russia. Grab so. the marker. If the base can see the marker, it will follow it. With the marker, you can hold it in your hand or you can clip it on your clothes. We need your help to refine the design and make this a reality. What we want to do is take this looks like model. Okay, you get it. So I'm sure right now you're saying, well, that's not movies. This doesn't work in movies. I mean, we have thousands of movie examples. I'll show you those in a second. How many of you want one of those? Anybody? How, how many of you know that person? Good. Not that many. All right, good. <laughs> We're moving in the right direction. So this is our tour for the next like 11 minutes. What is crowdfunding? Who's using it? Why are they using it? How are they using it? Where are they using it? So very simply, what is crowdfunding? Uh, it's just a lot of people getting together for one passion, right, who have passion, sorry, to make one idea happen. And you see the little footnote there where Peter called out premiums? The footnote is that often you're getting something in return which is called a perk, which is what we call a perk. Other platforms will call it something else. Now, the perk is because you all raised your hand, right? You all said you wanted it. That's because you're going to pay for it and you wanted something back. So that's what they're offering. They're offering perks in return. They're products. Uh, some people don't offer perks. There's four reasons why anybody funds anything in life. Number one is because they care about the person, the cause, or the campaign. So when I started a cancer charity, people were funding it because they just, you know, like my dad, they like me, they like, don't like cancer, whatever. Some people, number two, they want perks. So they want the product, the service, the experience, the limited edition item, the behind the scenes, the whatever you want to call it. So movies have tons of that stuff, right? Credits, parties, limited editions, first access, blah, blah, blah. The third reason is people want to be part of a group or they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. So the reason Statue of Liberty was funded is because they want to be part of liberty in America. They want to be part of something. And the fourth reason is profit. That's the profit guy. <laughs> so we're not going to talk about profit. At least I'm not. Barbara's going to talk about it. Uh, in the US, it's actually very difficult, practically impossible, to be able to solicit for-profit investments through the crowd, um, practically illegal. Unless you're SEC sanctioned and you can substitute your local funding body for SEC, it's practically the same everywhere in the world. There will be companies such as Barbara's that will say we can get around this, but it'll have limitations. To keep in mind on Indiegogo, there are zero limitations to what can be funded on Indiegogo from who? And when I say zero, I mean zero. So who's funding? I mean, everybody. Entrepreneurs that President Obama is talking about in the White House blog three weeks ago, artists, community activists, education, films, music, it really fundamentally does not matter. People are funding funerals, people are funding in vitro fertilization, people are funding, oh, we we're gonna have the first crowdfunded baby. It's gonna come off of Indiegogo, I promise. We just had, she just announced on an update, yes, that woman has her eyes in the back, yes. A crowdfunded baby, the masses came together, because in America, the health insurance companies, because health insurance is not provided by the government, the health insurance companies will not pay for in vitro fertilization, it's very expensive. So not many families can even afford it. So they actually put the campaign on Indiegogo and their friends and family and the public funded it. Fascinating. Who would do that? But it happens. <laughs> so here are just some examples. But what I want to highlight is, you know, the, these are all business examples, but I'll just show you like uh, a couple film examples. Here's like uh, in, going with European stuff. Um, this is like a... Uh, a 3D printer company. I don't know if any of you have played with a 3D printer. It's like a 2D printer, but big difference, it's 3D. So it's actually objects. So in the UK, they wanted to commercialize it, so they wanted to raise 30 grand. They raised nearly 160,000. Do they know 160,000 worth of people? No, they knew like 12,000 worth of people. Um, here's like a campaign that's already been used. They won an award at South By recently. They've now done their fourth campaign, sounded out. I'm moving really fast here. But here's a UK example, which is, was at uh, Sheffield, also been winning awards. Classic Hello, example I'm of Anthony how you Baxter, should do yours. a filmmaker based in Scotland. And I'm here to play you a short trailer from our new feature documentary, You've Been Trumped, which with your help will have its world premiere at the beginning of May. It tells the story of the property tycoon Donald Trump building a luxury golf course resort on what the scientists say is the crown jewels of Scotland's natural heritage. Hello, 
It will be the greatest golf course anywhere in the world. Actually, when I finish, it will be far more beautiful. These wilderness environments are um, our equivalent, if you like, of the Amazon rainforest. We've had tremendous support from the environmental groups. This very damaging, large-scale golf course, the whole package is wrong. They built the road on top of my spring, and I haven't had water for a week. This property is terribly maintained. It's slum-like, it's disgusting. He's got stuff thrown all over the place. He lives like a pig. It's my home. I've stayed here for 43 years now. And he so I'm sorry, it's just like a limited time, I so I'm gonna cut it off. Trump people. I know that's terrible. You can go on my site. You can totally watch it. There's like thousands of them. As a matter of fact, 15 of the top movies that have won awards in this year's festivals, including Can, Sundance, South By, the winner of South, the winner of Tribeca, funded on Indiegogo. Go check it out. It's fun. Go buy some stuff. Whatever you want. I only have like six minutes left. So what you really want is the data. Okay, so here are the six reasons why I actually should use crowdfunding. So one of the things is you actually think you came here for money. And I'll tell you very clearly, and this is fact, the least important thing that you get from a crowdfunding campaign is the money. The least. Meaning if you can get $100,000 in your hand, or you can get $100,000 from crowdfunding, it is much more valuable to get $100,000 from crowdfunding. Why? And I have to go really fast, I'm sorry. But one, you get to gauge demand and mitigate risk. Why do something unless you know there's demand and if there's not demand? Why have to deal with the inventory, the cost, the actual production? Why not have to pre-sell the 100,000 spectators or the viewers before you actually create it? Number two, you could test the marketing. So is your actual approach to marketing this good? Is it for young girls or old women? For young boys, old men? So you can test this in very micro approaches with the videos that you just saw or other wording. You can get extra promotion. So 90% of the funding, 90% <clears throat> extra of the promotion that you'll get will come from Indiegogo and the fact that all of these people will bring all their audiences into one place and all gets aggregated. And then you get the customer data. So often you're get, you get separated from your customers because somebody else is doing the transaction. So you don't get the customer name, the email, the local address, all kinds of amazing stuff. On Indiegogo, you keep all of that. You put it into your database. I know I'm talking really fast. Um, and then you also get to uh, curry serendipity, which if you put it out in the world, you can get a lot back. But if you don't put it out in the world and you're secretive, you can't get anything. Right? So it's amazing what can happen. And then, of course, yes, you get money. That's wonderful. But, you know. So there's a lot of reasons why this is working now. Um, we can talk about it later, but the number one thing here is instead of transactions, you want to move into a world of relationships because transactions get marginalized. See, because if you have two organizations doing the same transaction, which everyone is cheaper, you go with. But in a world of relationships, it's really hard to marginalize relationship, which is why big companies try to develop a brand with you. So how do you actually do this? It's, six, six, it's a six-step process. We'll make an assumption that you understand how to do this. If you don't, just follow up with me. We have a great customer happiness team that can explain this all to you. Now this is where you want the most, which is the secrets of success. And I have four minutes. So this is all you need to know. An honest and engaging pitch, be proactive, and find an audience that cares. So this is where you're gonna wanna probably start writing, but you don't need to. Which is an honest and engaging pitch. It has five components. Number one, you wanna have a video campaign. We know that if you have a video campaign versus a non-video campaign, you'll raise 122% more money than if you have a non-video campaign. It does not mean that you have a trailer. A trailer is the equivalent of having a non-video campaign. It is only your vertical that has a video as part of your cell, right? So the actual video campaign is a personal and engaging pitch. You saw Anthony, hi, I'm Anthony Baxter. And I, that was an honest and engaging pitch. A trailer is the equivalent of selling. People do not just sell on Indiegogo. You do that on Amazon or an infomercial. Number two, you need to have an honest and realistic goal. So it doesn't matter if it's high or low. You can ask me, can I raise 20,000, 2 million, 5 million? You can raise whatever you want. The crowd will know if it's honest and realistic, and they will see you out as transparent. The third thing is you want to have a good deadline between 1 and 120 days. We see the most success happen between 30 to 70 days. That doesn't mean that your campaign should be 30 to 70 days. You should optimize however the duration as short as possible to be always working. See, because if you work less, your go-go factor will go down, and we'll explain that in a second, which is the algorithm which tracks how active every campaign is. Because you'll ask me, how do I get on your homepage? How do I get into the New York Times? The higher your go-go factor is in a democratic world, the more we'll promote you. Because we don't have opinions. We're not curators. We're not gatekeepers. The world moderates itself. So the higher your go-go factor, the more promotion you get. The shorter the duration of time, the higher your go-go factor could be. Make sense? 
perks. You want to have honest, sorry, you want to have uh, um, perks that are unique, creative. You want to have a low, medium, and high. You don't want to just have something that they could buy somewhere right next to you. It needs to be unique. And the last thing is you want to have honest and engaging copy, which mimics the video. It starts with, this is who I am. Not, my movie starts in the backyard of somebody's house. No one cares. I hate to say that to you. They want to know who they're funding first. As much as you think your movie is what's getting funded, you know, half of the investment, if not more, is going into the team, right? So that's really what happens on the internet as well. Number two, you need to be proactive. We know that if you have four more people on your team, you'll raise 70% more money than if you have one person on your team. If you do 13 or more updates, so you can refresh your campaign with new information. If you do 13 or more updates, you'll raise 65% more money than if you do five or less updates. We know that your number one promotional tool, no questions asked, is email. Number two is Facebook. Number three is Twitter. It's not even close. Email destroys Facebook. Facebook destroys Twitter. We track every single action that happens on our site. 40,000 campaigns, thousands of you know, data points for each one. We know exactly how much every single person is getting for every single reach out. It's all tracked, right? So you really can't debate with me on this, <laughs> right? The next thing is um, you want to be very proactive in terms of reaching out using the, uh, your emails. You want to get partners to give you their email addresses. You want to use brands and they get their organizations. And you want to be consistent. One of the first things you'll want to say is, I don't want to look cheap. I don't want to ask people too many times. I don't want to spam. Well, the funny thing is, if you don't ask like seven times for anything in life, you don't get it. Most of the times, these people will not see your emails. They don't know that you're asking. You need to be super direct. You don't write like a three-page uh, email. At the bottom, say, and if you want to help, thanks. You write in the header, in the actual subject, 31 days to raise 100,000 euros for this movie. If it can't be any more direct than that, then they won't understand. And that's what you need to do in life. Forget Indiegogo, in life, you need to be that direct. <laughs> right? You have 15 seconds. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Well, the, the most important part is actually how to find an audience that cares. The most important thing to know is there's not leprechauns on Indiegogo, buckets of gold just waiting to just pour it into your campaign. It doesn't work like that anywhere in life. So what you need to do is get social proof first, just like in real life. So social proof on Indiegogo is proven to be about 30 to 40% of your campaign. Once you reach about 30 to 40% of your campaign, you can get stranger dollars. Before that, only your friends, your family, your mom, your fans, or whoever will fund you. Once you get social proof, we know that you can get strangers. You can get strangers at zero very rarely, right? But then you want to get as much exposure to the world as possible. The way you get more exposure to the world and our millions of page views and all that nonsense is by having a higher go-go factor. So you get social proof, get a higher go-go factor, you get exposed to the world, you get lots of money. Done. Terrific. Thanks very much, Slava. Oh, here's, this is a, a page with some of the hundreds of competitors we have. So I could have like, you know, discussed how you should choose somebody, but go check out yourself. There's 200 competitors. They're all great. Have fun. <laughs> yeah, close it. Great. Oh, okay, anyway. And now we have Barbara Tonelli, Director of Acquisition from Tusco Prod from France. So we'll hear another perspective on how we get the money together. The clicker. Good morning to everyone. So I'm not so fluent like him in English, so I will be Hi. slow, <laughs> more slow on my presentation. So just to explain who we are, we have a French company. If we started uh, in January 2009, so we were the first platform uh, that uh, started with the crowdfunding. And uh, today we have uh, 15,000 members on our website, and we have co-financed uh, 19 projects for a total of 600,000 euros. Uh, but I th if est-ce qu'on peut envoyer la vidéo? I, I think this will explain better. Tusco Prod vous permet de coproduire des films pour le cinéma, des documentaires et même des séries à partir de 10 euros. Il suffit de sélectionner un projet dans le catalogue, le découvrir à travers. Well, anyway, <laughs> when they were ready. Um, the main idea was uh, well, we work only with produ independent uh, producer and distributors. And uh, as Lava said before, uh, we uh, do a big, sel a very selection on the projects because we can take only two projects per month. 
uh, because uh, uh, we do all the marketing for these, these projects and uh, we do all the, the, the animation, as we call that. Uh, so we go to looking for the people on the blog, uh, on the forum, uh, on the social networks. Uh, so maybe we can now? Opportunity to co-produce movies, documentaries, and even TV series by investing as low as 10 euros per project. Select a project from our catalog, read more about it, check out the related videos, and pay online to become a co-prod in one single click. Then get access to exclusive content, special rewards, and events, plus get a share of the earnings returned by each project. For example, you will find in the Profits and Services section of the project page, invitations to the shooting and the premieres, DVDs, movie tickets, online private screenings, and much more. There's room for all kinds of budgets. You just have to choose your reward according to your subscription. The ultimate goal is to speed up fundraising for high potential films that are in the process of seeking financing to be produced. Join a growing community that promotes movies through social networking. Grab an active co-production scene in a unique adventure that supports film creation. Get behind the scene and play a leading role in the success of your films. Join us today at tuscoproud.com. So this was what we were before, because uh, next week we will start a new platform. We'll, we start uh, V3 of uh, Tusco Prod. So we opened the door to all the project, to all the project leaders. So that means that we became a, platform, a technical platform for all the project leaders that want to up update a project on the platform. And, uh, and so to find uh, some money for the films, but also to create the audience involvement uh, for, uh, for to support the project uh, until, from the production until to the theatrical release. I have to say that we do only films and audiovisual um, uh, stuff. We are not open to any projects. So also video clip or, um, uh, TV series, crowd, um, all the new support, but only on cinema and TV. The new version, if I can have the slide, so um, is uh, voilà, this is this is the new version of the website. It's the first time that I show something because it will be online next week. And uh, the new version is uh, based on three axes, principal axes for the project leader is uh, finance, broadcast, and promote. And for the internet user, internet member, is produce, watch, and share. That means that uh, the to finance. So I will try to explain very quickly because we don't have time. Um, subscribing the project, the internet user have uh, uh, three level. Uh, they have access to three level. The first one to finance, so to have uh, to produce a film. So this is. So they have some uh, services that are proposed to them. Uh, in these services, uh, the project leader can choose um, to, for example, to give the DVD, uh, uh, come to the shooting on the film, etc. And the new, uh, the, the new thing that we have developed is the VOD platform integrated in Tuscoprod. So we became at the same time broadcast because the project leader can offer to their their uh, members uh, to see a film, to, to have uh, a film free. So uh, that means that uh, the internet user can't buy the VOD directly on Tuscoprod, but it's the project leader that offer VOD to their uh, members, subscribers. And uh, at the same time, they can, with their film, integrate the video library of Tuscoprod. So they can show their film in Premiere or VOD, or integrate the, uh, the catalog, and so this open a right of remuneration for the project leader. Because naturally, at the end of the, of the, of the raise of the money, I will pay the right owner uh, for this, uh, for this uh, VOD. Um, 
so uh, well, and the third part is to promote the film. But I think I think uh, all the crowdfunding platform resort um, think at the same time, so, at the same manner. So Slava explain exactly what uh, you have to do for uh, be performant and raise money on your project. Um, uh, the VOD platform is something quite uh, unique because we are the only website that uh, developed that, that. I have to say that we were financed by the CNC for uh, this uh, for this platform, and the idea is uh, is to be able to give something immediately to the to the um, subscribers because when you promise a DVD or um, goodies or things like that, frequently you have to wait or the end of the raise of money because uh, our website um, work like a lot of other ones. So you have to raise the money before a date. If you don't raise this money, the, the internet user are not debt on their, uh, on their credit card. And, um, and uh, so, you have uh, frequently you you don't give these uh, these goodies, or you have to wait the end of this uh, resume money, or for the DVD or other things you have to wait anyone that the film is finished, and so the the, the internet user will will have to wait. So the VOD gives something absolutely um, that's something material in, in, in some way uh, immediately to the to the to the internet user. Um, I think it was quite quickly at the end. So I don't know if um, if we have we want to leave a little bit of time. Uh, well, I, I will I will show just a little bit. This is the presentation, so you can see there is. A Hello. Ça marche? No. We, yes. Okay. Great. So it's in three part. Sorry, it's very. <laughs> Small, but so there is. A, you can't really. It's produce, so produce, broadcast. Uh, it's a produ produce, watch, and uh, share. So in every time you enter in a page, this is the home page. So the, the, here we will be the video that will uh, turn all the time. There is the best progression, the f the film that are the most view, and uh, the the actuality is the most uh, clicked. Uh, after that, this is the presentation of the project. So there is the main videos, and everyone, every time you can open other windows, and here you have all the things which who you have right. And uh, here is the is the homepage of uh, Watch. So it's the video tech, the film library to who you have right because you have subscribed to some projects. Um, and this is the actuality, actuality uh, your actuality that you can share with your friends. So there are all the, naturally there is the directly you can do, you can share with Facebook, tweet, uh, Twitter, well, all the social networks uh, that you can use. Well, so the platform is uh, it will be in French next uh, week at the end of the month in English, and uh, for the end of the year, there will be the European platform in uh, Spanish, Italian, and German. So this is the big development that uh, we made uh, in the last year. Great, if I could just um, ask you, Barbara, the question I raised at the beginning. Is it, are there ways of combining crowdfunding with subsidy money, with licenses from broadcasters? You found a way where you can pull all that together? Yes, well, for the French, mm, so it's, uh, it's, there is, I didn't <laughs> say something. Um, it's like a private uh, fund for, so when you do uh, a budget, it's, it's became a private fund. So the, the CNC now is start to, to be able to, to be used to, to, to see us on their <laughs> budget. And, but for the new project, the project leader, there's not uh, there's not uh, retour uh, retour um, incomes for the internet users. It's only on the project, so on the one project per month that I will choose and I will deal with the producer and the distributors that they will have the the share the the, the incomes because uh, we test our public. It's now we have a little we have three years enough of uh, life, so we. 
with uh, uh, we know our uh, users and um, the it's the real it's a public of uh, cinephile of uh, people really that come for the for to um, because they are interested on cinema to support to to be part of the projects so um, and we always we did, we never sell the benefit like this, the primary thing this is the reason why we are the, the services uh, the benefits for the big films we are just because be film always independent i i want to say that uh, it's just it was just to to uh, to say that it, there was a film that had a real big success they could to recuperate their their money back also oh, after that we, we we know that they will invest on other films so the idea is to to play and not to to make money with uh, i think that if it was uh, possible Maybe all the okay. people would have done that before. Okay, thanks so much. We just got five minutes left. So, do any of you have any questions for any of our great panelists at the back there? Could you just speak loudly? Yeah, yeah, or there's yeah. a microphone. I try to do my best. I'm addressing the question to you, Mr. Slava. Uh, basically, I was wondering what happens to the money if you, for some reason, can raise enough money for a project. Uh, what What is the genuine and honest way to deal with the money afterwards? So, I mean, are you transferring back the money or are you uh, extend the date or, or what's going to happen with the money? Hello. Hello. Um, since we launched in January 2008, we actually have over 250 competitors, so I can't speak for every single competitor. Some will uh, not give you your money unless you hit your goal. Some give you your money uh, no matter what. Some will give you the money back. It's all kinds of different rules. I can only speak for Indiegogo. On Indiegogo, you get to choose if you want fixed funding or flexible funding. If you choose fixed funding, if you don't hit your goal, all the money go goes back to the actual funders and there's no charge for anybody, okay? If you choose flexible funding, which most people choose, um, it means that if you don't hit your goal, you'll still get your money no matter how much it is. So let's say you wanted to raise uh, 20,000, you raise 3,000, you'll still get the 3,000. So the important question is you're probably saying, wow, why would somebody get 3,000 if they wanted 20? Well, you should ask yourself if they get three out of 20, if they get 22 out of 20, or if they get 120 out of 20, the question is the same, which is you want to believe that you will get what you asked for and they will do what they told you, no matter what. And the key to that is not what amount is raised, it's communication and relationship. It's transparency. Remember, Indiegogo and crowdfunding is not about individual transactions. Go on Amazon and sell your movie, right? Crowdfunding is about developing a community, relationships, and people want to be part of that. So just as long as you're honest, it'll work out no matter how much you raise. Great. Next question over here. Hi. Are you finding producers get, um, getting people creatively involved in projects? For example, showing them rushes on the way and saying, what do you think? Do you like this character, this thing? Or is it more very much the, the, the sort of the, the money and how things are going without asking for their opinion in that sense? That makes sense. Slava, do you want to take? I mean, I'll, sh I'll share the stage. If um, we used to allow there to be a little bit more sharing in terms of maybe you want to get more input. Uh, we fundamentally found out that that confused the funder because the funder, we make it very simple. There's only one thing to do on Indiegogo. If you're on our site, you can only give money or not. Now, in terms of how people actually do engage their community, in terms of wanting feedback, it's totally up to you. Our platform is not created to crowdsource UGC content. It's not created to get votes. It's not created to get feedback. You can get it. It's up to you. That's not what it's for, so that people can get more money. Okay, Peter. Oh, I, I do think, though, there is a kind of movement towards, uh, well, UGC, uh, user-generated participatory media production. There's many more and more examples of that. So I think people do, w with a major distrust of the major media, I think we want to uh, be transparent. And, and if we can be part of the creation, as I say, every citizen now is a pro so we, we So there's, there's no smoke and mirrors about how movies are made, and we'd like to participate in those uh, productions. So. I think that builds communities that way. One more question. There, lady just here. Hi, oh. just a question in terms of the sums of money that you've raised. I mean, the budgets that we're looking at on features are about four million, five million sterling, and the figures you've been talking about are around the 20,000, 100,000. So um, how realistic is it to go for some of the larger um, budget films? 
for the experience, I can tell you that the maximum that we raise today is 80,000 euros on one film. It's the maximum. But it's true that uh, our community was quite uh, small, because if you think uh, the... After that, I don't know, um, I, I can't really tell you, because uh, the age of stupid, I think they... they, they, yeah, they yeah, exactly. So it, it's possible. It's not. Uh, it depends how you uh, animate you um, you work your community at the same time, and I think also the the kind of engagement that has the the pro because it's it's logical. They say documentary, for example, can have a real good potential on community uh, power to uh, aggregate people. For example, I think the age of stupid is what happened at the same time. I mean, it's, uh, it's depend on, it's logical on a comedy. I don't know if it will work. I, I think there is a trend, though, towards uh, moving uh, what were short films uh, funded, crowdfunded, and, and documentaries now into feature film production. So you have the Rotterdam Film Festival, for example, putting up a, a select number of six projects, I think, uh, and f uh, funding, well, low budget feature uh, dramatic films. And, and Tusco Pro is uh, doing the similar work with the Festival Nouveau in Montreal, where a select number of feature films are being put up. And the, the database of festival goers is helping to crowdfund uh, mm. fiction. Slava, Slava, what's the m and most you've raised? I mean, people, we distribute millions of dollars every month. People have raised hundreds of thousands. The important question here is not how much can I raise on your platform. The question is how much can you raise on my platform? <laughs> you, you get it? It's how much, so Obama, if he used Indiegogo, would have raised over a million dollars a day in sub $1,000 contributions. Every day, right? So the first year that we came out, we had no examples. People were like, can you really raise $5,000? I don't know. A year later, they were like, can we raise $20,000? A year later, they were like, can we raise $100,000? Meaning all these proofs are happening. I have no doubt, zero, that people will be raising millions of dollars per movie in a few years. Okay, I, last think, so last I, I think Peter. next year when Obama becomes ex-president, he will become a filmmaker. <laughs> and, uh, and he'll be raising them billion-dollar budgets. Barbara, yeah, but I can tell you that um, anyway, for, to, to answer to your question, is that, uh, when, you, when we raise 30,000 euros on a documentary, we are sometimes more than 10% of the budget. So it starts to be quite, quite important for... And, and so, so, you, so you can know quality. One of the movies just got picked up by Weinstein Company. It was crowdfunded on Indiegogo, and then it was bought by Weinstein. So if that gives you a sense of... Exactly. Probably all of you would maybe want to get bought by Weinstein. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, some but not all. Okay, well, th would you please join me in thanking this terrific panel for this <laughs> session on crowdsourcing. I'm available for questions after if you want them just outside.